Welcome back to another brand new episode of the Mark Agnesi Show. Woo! That's episode two. Woo! Over 60,000 people have already tuned into episode one in the first week. Thank you guys so much for your support and watching. Um, the comments were mixed. We get it. It was a mixed comment. Uh, at the end of episode one, I said it was going to get better. Um, you know, the interviews are already filmed, man. So, you know, the, we already filmed the interviews. So, yeah, the microphone thing, totally feel you guys. Unfortunately, it's going to have to wait till season two because all that stuff's already filmed. But I think it's about the quality of the content. Not the, not the audio quality. But hey, I did add a live studio audience. We are now coming uh, uh, from a live studio audience. So we have that moving forward as well. This week, uh, my guest Dawes frontman Taylor Goldsmith stops by. Uh, which is yeah, we, like her. Uh, we talk about Dawes' new record, Passwords. Uh, we talk a little bit about the work he did with T-Bone, uh, Burnett, Woo! and Elvis Costello on the basement tapes. We also, he brought a really cool guitar by uh, for show and tell. And we also sat down and played a song. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. But before we get into all of that, we got to see what's going on in the depths of guitar nerddom on the internet. Let's take a look at this week's viral video. Viral video. All right, so this week's viral video came to me through Instagram. Uh, it's just from the Great Moscow Circus. I mean, check this out. dancing on your pedalboard now, dickhead. All right, you really committed on this one. Yeah, I hope you don't have to set a tap tempo or anything. Um, three comments on this video. Uh, first of all, how the hell did he get up there? You know, is what I'm thinking. More importantly, second question, how did he get down from there exactly? And third question, isn't there a fucking SG in, I mean, come on, I know we're in Moscow right now or whatever, but the Telecaster playing ACDC, I mean, come on, let's get the guy the right guitar. It looks like a big production show. Guys, this is what the internet was invented for, videos like this. There's this week's viral video. Viral video. All right, so my guest this week is one of the great songwriters of this generation. I got a chance to sit down with him back in June, just a couple of days after his band Dawes' uh, album Passwords came out. We had some brunch. We talked for over an hour. We did a great little show and tell uh, with some of his guitars. And we also sat down and played some songs. Check it out when I sat down with Dawes frontman Taylor Goldsmith. Hey everybody, Mark Agnesi here. We're on my sofa in the living room again. My good friend Taylor Goldsmith from the band Dawes is here. Good to see you. Dude, thanks for coming by. Thanks I know for this having is a me. busy week for you guys. We yeah. just brunched pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a small buzz going. Your new record came out this week. Two days right? ago. Two days ago. Yeah. Friday. Congratulations. Thank this you. is what album number six. Six. Yeah. For the band. Yeah. Very what good. did you start on? What was your first instrument? Well, I, I know I, you play both and you write on, on both. What's the primary I started, instrument? when I was six years old, I took piano lessons and I didn't retain anything. But I think like somewhere in like a deep recess of my brain I did because once I gave it up after like three years of piano lessons and not, and not knowing how to do anything, then I picked up guitar at, at 12, so like after I met Blake. Um, and then through the little bit that I learned on guitar, I was able to apply that to the, what I remember from piano. So I was able to take my like Beatles chord books and, and read what like oh yeah. it's a B minor oh it's a D and, and like and just go off of what the guitar tabs were. Yeah. And that kind of retaught me piano. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of learning both at the same time, but I guess in a way, technically like piano first, but but really guitar more purely guitar. Instrument yeah. You really took seriously. Yeah. And my main priority was songwriting. So I, I learned enough to compose and to like understand how chords work together, but I was never anything more than a rhythm guitar player until DOS. So, so until I was 20 years old, I never even mm. thought of taking a solo or how to put, to put a solo together, be a lead guitar player at all. You never had like, like an Yngwie phase or no. a Steve Vai phase. You never had like a, shred, a shredder phase. I feel like that would have helped like me now. Yeah. Like yeah. It, was always, it was always about songs. Yeah, it was always it, songwriting. And then, and then when, when 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 Blake left and we couldn't find a guitarist, meanwhile I was kind of just in my room playing along to records all the time and I was understanding the correlation between like 
how to lead a line into the next chord and how to and, and very simple like okay, so at that stuff. time like who like who are you listening to? like who are the guys that you're like you know this is this is right. how I, I can wanna, do how that. I yeah. want to do it and like it started do you remember out who like the two or three guys who who you were yeah it was it started out with 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 um with David Lindley no. um because his his stuff is so lyrical and melodic where like he'll do something that is really moving but it's still like five notes and it's never like he never gets super smart or, or no. weird and like he's not there to like fool around with you he's there to be really soulful at all times and then and also simple but that's almost like just a byproduct of it it doesn't seem intentional it just seems like that's who he is and that's what he does and that led me to um and then like trying to like you know play within changes and landing on the chord tones like very simple like soloing 101 kind of stuff that led me to certain kind of like chromatic moves that like I think from like thinking that way and playing that way people are like you should listen to Jerry because like that you're kind of like you're kind of hinting at it yeah. and and then I then that got me very deep into the Grateful Dead and the and that and to me that really informed the way I played at that time I don't know if it's still is a big factor but the way Jerry would would use the chromatic kind of scale or use certain moves like the raised fourth and certain things that that felt very specific to his well, yeah, yeah, enough of musical theory yeah. already with the stuff that you guys were writing that, yeah. that seems like a fairly natural right. progression the smart kind of take on it and that and that was, was always what i had to rely on i could never i never because i didn't have that ying bay phase i never could just start chunks. Yeah, just, yeah i never yeah. like okay we're here in this key i'm just gonna rip, rip one, like yeah. for me if, if there's gonna be a, a a special moment in a solo of mine if <laughs> then it'll be if it'll be like <laughs> special moment in my solos recently, yeah. it'll be it'll be um it'll be because of like a, a note choice or an interval yeah, choice like amp reacted when you yeah, hit it yeah yeah but magical nuance right but not that, because yeah. i'm flying you know <laughs> i want to talk about the the, the new basement tapes because that was really cool and the thing and i want to talk about working with i mean elvis costello yeah with, working with t-bone yeah because uh i mean let's talk about like one of the the great American record producers yeah. to ever live, yeah. T-Bone Burnett. Everything he touches true. is truly spectacular. Yeah. What, how did that come about? Like, start at the top. Cause like, how did you get approached about that? Yeah. What was your reaction when you're like, T-Bone Burnett wants you to, yeah. to make songs out of a bunch of old Bob Dylan lyrics? Yeah. It started from the uh, incredible generosity of, of Marcus Mumford, really, for me. Because T-Bone went to him first. T-Bone got these lyrics of Bob Dylan about Just for Dylan. everybody who doesn't know, yeah, like Dylan Dylan wrote basement tapes, was, extra lyrics. Yeah, he wrote some extra yeah. tunes. Like like there's the basement tapes with the band that you can all hear, um, and and then but he typed up way more lyrics than what they recorded um, that was never had music written to it. So somehow T Bone got a hold of those lyrics, and he was like, "Wouldn't it be fun to put together a band where they wrote new music for this old?" Basement Tapes era Bob Dylan, Dylan words. words. Then Elvis Costello, Jim James from My Morning Jacket, and Rhiannon Giddens were the other three, so it was the five of us. And, um, and we had two weeks to record something. Like, we didn't know, for all, I, for all we knew, because we really had no idea, we would finish four songs and have an EP worth of material because it's two weeks and mm -hmm. who knows. No one tried to run the room. No one tried to say, this is what I'm hearing. Because I feel like that just would have stopped us, especially with like four or five rather very creative people and then on top of that T-Bone Burnett kind of uh, being the ringleader. How, how, how involved was he? How much did he, he let you guys go? How much did he wrangle? Or, or were there times where he brought it in and let you go in? Yeah. yeah like his his powers are like are like mystical like he his approach to producing is something that was really profound and also something I'd never seen done uh, in, in, in that way and I mean it, it works so beautifully like I'm a, I can be a very analytically minded person like I can be the kind of guy where I'd go up to T-Bone it's like should I play this inversion with the 7 on top or should the 7 be in the chord and, he, and he's like uh, whatever like you know like I mean he cared but it was sort of like that's not what we should be Focus focused on, on. Yeah. Um, whereas like and so that's kind of how my brain can tend to work whereas with him um, like there were I remember one song in, in particular where Elvis was on a keyboard and Marcus was on drums and we didn't do a great take and, and we didn't know the song that well yet. And so like we weren't really locked yet and and, and, and Elvis was missing chords just because he didn't know it yet. So so 
um, that I noticed, and, and then when, when, when T-Bone came into the room, Elvis, he was like, how would you guys feel? And Elvis was like, I missed a lot of chords, I want to do that again. And Marcus was like, yeah, I wasn't totally locked, I want to do that again with the drums. And, um, and T-Bone was like, no, you guys were great. And, and I was like, uh, I heard what they heard, but I didn't say anything. I just, yeah. I just stayed quiet. And I was like, well, that's weird. I would think he would say like, yeah, you were right. Like, let's get it. Let's yeah. nail it. But he was like, no, no, do exactly what you just did. And he walked back in the room and then we played it again and they both were great. And they locked in. And yeah, and it was locked in and Elvis hit everything. And the reality, and I don't know if Elvis, if, if T-Bone thinks about it in these terms, but he, he imbued the room with this new found confidence. Like, like he he just he by like, like hey you play like shit kid get your yeah, shit like, together yeah you're right yeah, you, you did mess yeah. it up like it was, it was like, on TV yeah, it was right. like no you guys you sounded amazing like just do the same thing it allowed everybody to feel like wow maybe there's someone not hearing and like I'm gonna really like nail yeah. it again and how many songs did you guys end up cutting at, at by the by the time it was done by the time it was done we recorded fifty songs F and that was in the two weeks the two weeks time that you guys yeah had we to record do. fifty songs where are you most are, is a telecaster yeah. still your Probably, home base like like if I like if you told me we have a gig tomorrow and you can only bring one guitar so I would be in the and then you know like I got the Les Paul Jr. the fifty that's a fifty six I think um, and that became something that I really gravitated towards for like a whole tour it was like kind of the only thing I wanted Those, to play yeah. and. But the, the thing for me that I've learned is like, I play guitar as a guy who sings. You know, like I don't have that luxury of like, well, if I have my knob at eight, and, and I can like, run over and here and get yeah, this yeah, like, pedal, I can't, yeah. I unfortunately don't have that luxury. You're as stuck, much as I you're love stuck it. To a microphone. Yeah, and so like, I, like when it's a Les Paul Jr. and it's one pickup, or if it's a telly and I have it on the bridge pickup, like, I kind of, then I'm like, I know the where I'm at. Drill down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, but it's like, I can't get super, like, in, like, I, I can't get super tech. And some guys can, like, Blake can. Um, that's just not how I play. How into gear are you? <laughs> like, I spend all night, once I'm finally done with shit, staring at Yeah. Uh, my whole life is gear, and as soon as I'm yeah. done with all of it, in my free spare time, I sit and stare at gear that I want to buy. Yeah. <laughs> How much do you, is it, is it a thing? If it right. is a thing, like how hard do you chase it? Are you, are you an online guy when you're in different cities on tour? Do you go out right. and search out the stores? Is it a quest? Do you, is it just, is it just about finding miracle little things that speak to you? Or is there certain shit that it's like, I gotta knock, like me, I know the top five things on my list. Yeah. Like, <laughs> as soon as I get that fucking thing, I'm, I'm onto this and this. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like prioritized, right. it's on the sheet. How into gear are you? There was a period where, as, as, as you know, like I was in the store a lot more, where I was like, I really want to like build up like a proper Arsenal. touring rig, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like when it comes to pedals, like that, that was also a thing where it's like I'm not, like I said, like I'm, I'm when I'm, I'm, I'm on stage. I have to like, I have to like sing, so I can't get down and dial up a delay in the way that like that I that I know is really fun and I have a little bit of knowledge of. Yeah, yeah. But it's like it's not it's not like something that I, that's not how our band works. So it's 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 a lot it's a lot less about that. It's, so for me, it's always just been like I want this kind of guitar. I want a I want a three forty. I wanted a three thirty five, but then finding that a three forty five is is affordable and, <laughs> and, and the same thing. Yeah, the same exactly. Yeah. yeah, as long as you do the couple. Yeah, a couple little mods. Yeah, yeah. so mono that thing, kids. Yeah, mono yeah, exactly. it out. So, um, but yeah, it's like I you know you grow up and you're like wow like like a Stratocaster to this day is still like the image in like my 12 year old brain's mind of like, of like what rock and roll looks like, you mm -hmm. know? And like, sometimes I can, I remember that feeling, that warm feeling of like being a kid that can't afford any guitar and being like, wow, the difference between a Les Paul and the Strat, even just on the wall, even just looking at them next to each other and like who plays what, who's like a legend with what instrument. And that sort of mythology still resonates. It's still real. And and so like that part of me still is like wow like I'd love to play a twelve string rig even if like I have an amazing like Fender twelve like, like 12 yeah yeah that, huh? like but you know it's like stuff like that that like it's never gonna go away so like I'm always gonna be stoked to go chase down guitar shops when we're on tour and see if I can find something that is a new piece to to like this kind of little family I've created. Talk about uh, the new Dawes record password. Talk about the marketing of this because there's some really cool stuff that you guys yeah. were doing. And I've got so much stuff here, kids. I'm trying to figure it all out. But yeah. you guys have been leaving passwords throughout. Yeah, I mean, like explain we would, to me the marketing concept behind the record. The album's called Passwords. 
um, we had the idea that it could be cool to like, in the spirit of that, put put out passwords to unlock certain either videos or or news or or just ideas, um, uh, information out the, like on the website. So there's so there's this little box where you can type in uh, a password, and it's typically been um, melodies of guitar riffs or yeah. or, or vocal vo vocal melodies, and if you can kind of figure it out. Um, it'll unlock either a lyric video. I know there was like a play, a Spotify playlist of Griffin's that was like a bunch of records that he's listening to, like some really deep shit, it's like Keith Jarrett and some out stuff. And then, um, and there's there's like some demos that I have that uh, that are coming along. I, I mean, I'm not supposed to say that yet, but um, this but, won't uh, be out. Oh, okay, cool. Out. But yeah, like like uh, they, like That's cool. there's a uh, yeah, there's like there will be demos that people can find of like early versions of songs. Oh, cool. So it's like stuff like that, and we would we would put hints out there for people to go find them in other places. Like one was like we we commented on one of our own Instagram posts from like years ago and put and put one of the one passwords password there. And so we would we would do things like that, and people were really like able to like find it, share it with everyone. So we were nervous, like, oh, we're gonna put up this like you know Griffin's playlist or this like lyric video, and like no one's gonna care <laughs> and no one's gonna find it. And but it ended up being it ended up working really well, and it was actually really fun. It's gonna be a big year for you guys. Right. I'm really, I, the new record is fantastic. Thanks, man. And I'm really really excited to see what you guys have Thanks, coming man. up. The new record from Dawes, Passwords, is out now. Taylor Goldsmith, thank you for coming by. Check yeah. them out. I'm sure they're going to be coming uh, to a city or country yeah. continent near you. Yeah. The work's not. The work has only just begun for you, my friend. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you in a couple years. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming by. Yeah, for my full unedited interview with Taylor Goldsmith, make sure you subscribe to the channel below. Uh, we sat down and talked for over an hour about the early days of the band, the songwriting process, how guitars affect the songwriting process, studio stage. We touched on all sorts of stuff uh, for that interview and more behind the scenes footage. Make sure you subscribe below. Later that same day, we sat down for a very new segment that we're very excited about. I think you guys are gonna like it too. Here's more Taylor Goldsmith when we sat down for a little segment we like to call Show and Tell. Show and Tell. Oh, man, I love these. There is a guitar of the day with this. Yeah. Maybe a guitar of the day with both of these, but. I love these guitars. This is a century of progress, but this is a really, this is a really particularly special guitar that I fell in love with. I remember pulling it off the wall to show it to you. I'll let you hold it. What, what was it about this particular guitar? Now, obviously, you and Elvis have done a lot of stuff together, and this is kind of the Elvis kind of yeah, style. His, model. Kind of his model got based off of this guitar. But. And then, yeah, it's, it's, I guess it's like a thirty-eight. We think it's like a pre-war. It's yeah, late thirties. Yeah. Um, and then so someone carved his name into it. it says C. L. Foster, 1940. If you can see that. And then um, this and, is the rat. So you're gonna have to really get tight. Yeah, you gotta get close for this. There, the, he put a lot of pictures. Who I don't think it's the same person. I think it, like it's, it's like it's, family. It's the whole family, or it's a lot of women's yeah, pictures. Yeah, four four women's pictures. One that might have fallen off right there. Uh, maybe some of them are the same person. Maybe not. But uh, he put these, we assume, like, if it's around the late, late 30s, early 40s, um, then the, and the reason why he's putting pictures in a guitar is maybe because he was over in the war. Oh, yeah, like, he got this, this guitar this, this before thing, the war. This and thing went, went off to Europe. And um, one thing I didn't notice, and you pointed out to me earlier, is it looked like the name Kim. Yeah, several times. Is several carved. times has been carved into the... Yeah, Kim, Kim, Kim. KL, I see a KL. Yeah, there's, yeah. What was his thing? CL. CL Foster. CL Foster. I've seen a lot of KLs on here. People can say what they want about electric guitars and new stuff and old stuff and all like that. But acoustic guitars, man, when we talk about vintage guitars, and vintage guitars are a big passion of mine. I, I love old electric guitars, but old acoustic yeah. guitars are a whole it's different thing, man. Even oh. just like the science of like those. The paint and, and the, yeah, the, and the break away and, 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 and the way they age. And electric guitars, man, there's so much in that yeah. chain of events from the cable to the pickups to the yeah. pots to the caps to the amp to whatever you put in front of the amp to the cables between that. There's so many different events before that sound hits your ears. This, man, it's like it's wooden strings, man, and they don't all do it the same. Man, there's no new guitar in the world that sounds like that. Yeah, definitely. And, and you might not like it, or you might like it, but there's nothing else that sounds like that. The 
mellowness of the attack, even though you're hitting it with a flat pick, the roundness of the notes, you never get that out of the new guitar. It's just never. I mean, you wouldn't get that attack out of the 1950s Gibson guitar. Yeah. Or definitely not out of an adjustable side of the 60s guitar. This is what pre-war Gibson guitars are all about. That fat, warm roundness. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is, they're so great. And it just looks so good. Yeah, I know. It's and good. that, I mean, the story, the story is as impressive as the guitar. I just, I'm glad you got it because yeah. I still get to, yeah. I still get to see it and hang out with it again. It's, it's, when they get sent out other ways, you know, you never know what you're going to get. To check out more Taylor Goldsmith online, you can follow him on Instagram at, at Taylor Dawes Goldsmith. Make sure you also follow the band at Dawes the Band or check them out on their website, DawesTheBand.com for tour dates and when they're going to be coming to a town near you. <laughs> okay, so this week, we got to talk about something, guys. Something that's pissing me off, mega church worship guitar players pedal boards. <laughs> oh, yes. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, shit. oh boy. He's not going to make fun of people for praising the Lord, is he? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. You guys have seen these, these pictures of these pedal boards on the internet, right? These huge monstrosities of decadent geardom right here. And they're all the same. They all have the same thing. In the top left corner, we're going to see three to four Strymon pedals with the little digital readouts and all that stuff. Then we have the four to five Klon clones. Then we've got the true bypass switcher at the bottom, even though all the pedals are already true bypass. And then we've got the little <laughs> soft, the little soft button things on everything so it doesn't scuff the bottom of your designer boots. I mean, <laughs> come on, how many cavernous reverb sounds do you really have to have preset to play G, C, and D? I mean, for Christ's sake, literally. For Christ's sake, it doesn't have to be that simple. I mean, Jesus was a humble man, the son of a carpenter. I try to think, what would Jesus play? I'll tell you what Jesus would play. Jesus would probably be playing a used Mexican Strat into a PV Classic 30 that he got from his uncle when he toured all over Bethlehem and shit back in the day, and it would still work, and he'd plug straight into it, and you know what? He would probably get a great fucking sound. You don't have to have that much stuff in between. What are you trying to do with that many pedals in between the guitar and amp? Are you trying to take all the Satan out of the sound? I mean, come on. Guys, oh, we all know simple is better. These big, huge pedal boards, you just got to knock that shit off, okay? This is what I'm asking for. I think everybody's had enough of the big, huge pedal board. I mean, what would Jesus do? What would Keith Richards do? Just remember what Keith Richards pedal board. Episode two of the Mark Agnesi show. Whoop. Yeah, it's gonna get better, right? <laughs> yeah. Every week, just a little tiny thing better. I promise you guys should keep watching. Make sure you guys subscribe below uh, to the channel for all the behind the scenes footage and everything. Make sure you check out my website, markagnesi.com, for all sorts of fun merchandise and things you guys don't even know exist yet, but it's all there. Go check out markagnesi.com. And make sure you check out my guest, Taylor Goldsmith. You can follow him on Instagram at, at Taylor Dawes Goldsmith. And make sure you follow the band as well on Instagram at Dawes the Band or check them out online at DawesTheBand.com. That brings us to the end of episode two, to take it out, here's Taylor and I in my living room playing an old Rolling Stones classic in the Towns Van Zandt style. Here's me and Taylor doing Dead Flowers.
Sweet. Rad. That's very cool.